Before you watch The Chosen season four, you're gonna wanna check this out. There are so many moments from season three that are critical to understanding the events of season four. But even more important than that, there are deeper meanings hidden within the episodes of season three that most people don't even notice. Like the real reason the people of Nazareth wanna throw Jesus off a cliff, or the deeper meaning that is behind the cistern that Simon and Gaius are working on, or how a female shepherd is the key to understanding Eden and Simon's experiences in the water at the end of episode eight. And so in this video, we're gonna take a look at episodes one and two of season three, and I'm gonna to reveal to you everything you'll wanna remember before you start watching season four of The Chosen. Now, before we move on, if you love learning insights about The Chosen and wanna see connections between the show and the Bible that will transform the way you watch it, then click the link above and down in the description and download my free resource called Seven Biblical Secrets Hidden in the Chosen. This will show you connections to scripture and the first century world of Jesus that are present in the show, but most people don't notice. It's pretty powerful. We've packed a whole lot of information into a really small package, just like in this video. Speaking of, let's dive in. As episode one begins, we find Matthew standing outside of the home of his parents, arguing with them about why he's chosen the life of a tax collector. But as Matthew and his parents are arguing, his mother tells him that instead of collecting taxes for a living, he needs to trust in the Lord. And Matthew's response is really interesting. He says, can you name one thing Adonai has done for our people in a hundred years? 500. This one line says a lot because it explains to us why Jesus formed such a large following so quickly. You see, when Matthew says 500 years, he's referring to the moment that the Jewish people were sent into exile in Babylon. For two generations, the people were removed from their land, their temple, stripped of their freedom, and forced to live among the Babylonians. It was one of the most tragic moments in the history of the Israelite people. And it was during this exile that many of the prophecies about the Messiah began to form. There was a longing within the Israelite people for God to save them. And even after the people were set free from exile, this longing continued. Because from that point on, things were never the same. For the next several hundred years, the Israelite people were ruled by one empire after another after another. The Persians, the Greeks, the Ptolemies, the Seleucids, the oppression continued. Now, there was one moment of relief about 150 years before Jesus. At that time, a group called the Maccabees rose up and forcefully removed the Seleucids from the Holy Land. And for several generations, the Maccabees ruled the area and governed Israel. People thought that this might be the future of Israel, that God had finally given them their land back. But then the Romans came in, and everything they thought they'd gained was gone. The Jewish people were frustrated, they were devastated, they were confused. And once again, they were praying for a Messiah to come and to save them. Now, of course, not everyone agreed on what the Messiah would look like, right? Some, like the Zealots, sought to take matters into their own hands, to throw off the Romans as the Maccabees threw off the Seleucids. They were longing for a Messiah who would join them in battle. Others, like the Pharisees, believed that strict adherence to the law and a removal of sin from the community would usher in the Messiah. And then there were people like Matthew, who basically decided that instead of resisting Rome, he would join them. And as a tax collector, he was part of the Roman system. He'd found his own savior. But either way, the desire for a Messiah was strong and pervasive in first century Israel. For decades, different Messiah figures had popped up promising to save the people, and they drew large followings. And so does Jesus. Because in Jesus, people see the promises of scripture beginning to come true. In Jesus, they see a man who is healing the sick and giving sight to the blind. In Jesus, they sense that this might be the real thing, that he might be the actual Messiah. So they flock to him. They long to hear his teachings, to be a part of his movement, and for a lucky few, to actually be his disciples. Which leads us to the next important insight in this episode, one that occurs during one of Jesus' first encounters with his newest disciple, Judas. While Judas and Jesus are walking together, Judas makes it a point to let Jesus know that he has studied in something called a Beit Midrash. Now, this is one of those lines that just seems like a random Jewish phrase to most of us, but it's actually a very specific and significant reference. 
And in order to understand this, you have to understand something about Jewish culture and what it took to be a disciple. See, the truth is, few men ever actually got to be disciples. For us, disciple feels like a generic term, right? We are all disciples making disciples. Not so at the time of Jesus. Being a disciple was a rare honor that few earned. You see, all Jewish boys started religious education at an early age. From 6 to 10, they'd be in something called Beit Sefer. This means the house of the book. And for these four to five years, young boys would memorize significant portions of Scripture. They would memorize large portions of Genesis and Deuteronomy, a variety of Psalms. Some scholars even believe that in some cases, boys would memorize the first five books of the Bible. I mean, just imagine that, right? A nine-year-old memorizing all of this Scripture. Few of us today even have more than just a few verses memorized. I'm not even sure I've memorized all of my kids' names. And I've only got two kids, right? But, but back then, memorizing scripture was a part of every young Jewish boy's life. And if they excelled, if they showed real promise, then instead of going into the family trade, they would go to the next level, which was called Beit Talmud. In Beit Talmud, they'd memorize the entire Old Testament. Genesis through Malachi memorized 929 chapters, 23,000 verses, over 600,000 words memorized. And they did all of this between the ages of 10 and 14. And if they showed real promise here, again, rather than going into the family business, they'd go to another level. And this last one was called Beit Midrash. Beit Midrash was a form of higher education. Some young men would study with rabbis at the temple in Jerusalem. And others, the best among the best, would seek out a rabbi to follow. Their hope would be to study closely with him, follow him wherever he went, learn what he knew, say what he said, do what he did. They would want to be just like him. And if he was willing to accept them as a disciple, then they would give up their lives for this pursuit. Now, of course, in the episode, we learn that Judah's father died and he's not able to pursue this path. But he wants Jesus to know that he has studied under Beit Midrash, right? He's participated in this higher form of education. He's been told that he's among the best and the brightest. And by telling Jesus this, he's trying to prove his worth as a disciple. He's trying to let Jesus know that he's qualified, that Jesus made the right pick. But as we've seen, this isn't the sort of thing that Jesus cares about. Most of Jesus' disciples aren't among the most qualified. Some are particularly unqualified when it comes to discipling under a rabbi. And that's because while Jesus is inviting them to be disciples in the traditional sense, to follow him, to become just like him, he's also inviting them to something more. And the journey he's inviting them to take will lead them to far greater things than any other rabbi can offer. But it will also cost them more too. And that's what we see in our next scene. As Simon and Eden are finally reconnecting after a long time apart, we realize that they won't be alone for long, right? They're about to get a few new roommates. And and while this moment is very disappointing for us, right? It's very disappointing in the show. It really wouldn't have been that unexpected at the time of Jesus, especially not in a place like Capernaum. Capernaum is a fascinating place to go to in the Holy Land. It's the city where Jesus lived throughout most of his ministry. Peter and Andrew lived here. So did James and John. It would have been somewhere along the shores of Capernaum that Jesus saw these men fishing and asked them to be his disciples. It was here that a man was lowered through a roof to be healed by Jesus. And it was here that Jesus ate and slept and lived with Simon Peter's family. And that's because extended families and full households were a way of life in Capernaum. You see, within Capernaum today are ruins of many homes, including one that rests under a church. Underneath of St. Peter's Church are the ruins of a home that once belonged to Jesus' disciple, Simon Peter. Generations of people living in Capernaum, dating back to the time of Jesus, have remembered and recounted this place as Peter's actual house. But what stands out about Peter's house and those surrounding it is the layout. It's not a single family dwelling with a small entrance and a window. It's a multi-family home where generations would live together. Right? This type of home was referred to as an insula. In this one structure would be children and parents and grandparents and other extended friends and family. They would be closely connected 
They knew what was happening in one another's lives. They ate together, played together, partied together, and cried together. Right? There was a deep and intimate connection that allowed them to know and support one another in powerful ways. In fact, go back and watch the scenes in Simon and Eden's house. Right? Try to get a sense of how many rooms are in this house and how it reflects this insula dwelling. Because when you see how they lived in this insula dwelling that was fairly unique in Israel, you can see the connections to Jesus and the way he lives with his disciples. Jesus invites his disciples into an immersive, close relationship where they will observe everything he does and try to imitate it. This is how the rabbi-disciple relationship worked. They would live together, travel together, and be fully invested in one another's lives. And when you know this, it's easy to imagine what unfolds in this scene. That Jesus would set things up so that the other disciples would be living with Simon and Eden. This is how he wanted them to live. This was a way of teaching them something about the community that he was establishing. It was a way of life in this town that he wanted to be reflected throughout all of God's kingdom. In fact, this is the same sort of connection Jesus invites us to have with one another as the body of Christ. To be an insula connected to one another's lives in a powerful way that allows us to care for and support one another beyond the superficial. Right? One where we love one another and rely upon one another in a way that draws us closer to the Lord. A community just like Jesus and his disciples had in Capernaum. In fact, it's the closeness of this community that Jesus is establishing that actually makes our final scene so heartbreaking and surprising. Because later on in this episode, we begin to hear why Judas is following Jesus, what he believes about the Messiah. And through this, we subtly begin to get a glimpse of why Judas will ultimately betray Jesus one day. You see, at one point, as Judas is talking about Jesus, he says that Jesus will build something to match the Romans and that he will defeat the Romans and set us all free. And in just these two sentences, Judas tells us a lot about what he believes. In fact, he tells us a lot about what most people believed about the Messiah in the first century. You see, many people at the time of Jesus drew their beliefs about the coming Messiah directly from scriptures like Zechariah 14, where it says, A day of the Lord is coming, Jerusalem, when your possessions will be plundered and divided up within your very walls. I will gather all the nations to Jerusalem to fight against it. The city will be captured, the houses ransacked, and the women raped. Half of the city will go into exile, but the rest of the people will not be taken from the city. Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as he fights on the day of battle. On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives east of Jerusalem, and the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west, forming a great valley, with half of the mountain moving north and half moving south. Passages like this led many to believe that the Messiah would be a warrior, that he would come and throw out the oppressing nations like the Romans. Essenes believed this, zealots believed this, even many of the Pharisees believed this. The Messiah would be the son of David, and like David, he would be a warrior. His purpose was to restore God's land to God's people, to kick out foreign oppressors, and to lead people to be obedient to the law. In the centuries prior, the influence of Greek culture, also called Hellenism, had corrupted the people and caused them in many different ways to stop being faithful to God's law. But in Judaism, the law was a gift. It was what defined them as a people. It was a gift that God had given them that helped them to be free. And they wanted nothing more than to be free again. And so they believed that the Messiah would be a military king who would help them to do that who would help them to return to the glory days of old. From birth, this is what men like Judas had been told about and dreamed of. In fact, I want you to go back and just listen to the things that Judas and the other disciples say throughout this episode. The picture in their minds is clear. The problem, though, is that as we know, this isn't the kind of Messiah that Jesus will be. Jesus isn't coming to wage a war on Rome. He's coming to wage a war on sin. He isn't coming just to restore people's lands. He's coming to restore their hearts. And he isn't a savior who's coming to take lives. He's a savior who will come to give his life. This is who Jesus is. 
And over time, most of the disciples will come to realize and embrace this different picture of the Messiah and salvation. But here, we see seeds of Judas's demise. We get a hint that this may be the reason that he ultimately betrays Jesus. He has a picture in his mind of who Jesus will be, who he's giving his life to follow. But when that's not who Jesus proves to be, well, we'll just have to see how it all plays out. One of the most touching scenes of this episode comes at the very beginning, when Matthew sits down with his parents. Having just heard Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, Matthew is immediately trying to put into practice the teachings that struck his heart. And one thing that Matthew knows he needs to do is seek forgiveness from his family. You see, Matthew has been disowned by his family because of the line of work that he chose to go into, tax collection. But this rift isn't merely because Matthew joined some first century version of the IRS. It, it runs deeper than that. You see, tax collectors were despised at the time of Jesus. And it wasn't just because they were collecting taxes, it was why and how they collected them. You see, at the time of Jesus, there were two different types of tax collectors. Mokes and Gebai. Now, Gebai collected taxes on property, income, and poll taxes. These were generally set taxes and they couldn't really cheat people very greatly. But Mokes were tax collectors of imports, exports, trade goods, and anything that moved by road. They had great discretion and could easily cheat people. Because you see, Mokes would pay Rome in advance what was owed by the people. And then they would collect from the people whatever they wanted. And these funds that they collected above what they owed Rome, well, they could keep them for themselves. They were getting rich on the backs of their own people. The people were already poor, right? They were already poor to begin with. They were already oppressed by Roman taxes. They weren't even Roman citizens, which meant that they were paying for benefits they didn't even receive. And yet here the Mokes were, making them pay more on top of that. But for someone like Matthew, it was even worse. Because within Mokes, there were actually two types of Mokes, great Mokes and little Mokes. Zacchaeus would have been a great Mokes. He worked behind the scenes and hired others to collect taxes for him. But Matthew was a little Mokes. He saw people face to face. By being a Mokes, Matthew was seen as the worst type of tax collector. And this didn't just bring shame to him, it brought shame to his entire family. In Hebrew culture, the connection within a family was so close that the reputation of the people within your family could become the reputation of your entire family. And this just didn't apply to nuclear families of parents and kids. This could also apply to generations. The sins of one of your ancestors could shame your entire family for generations to come. This explains why Matthew's family would have severed ties with him and why the community shunned them. It also shows us why reconciliation is so amazing. Matthew has gone from oppressing his people to following the one who will save them. He's become a new man, one who will make his family proud. One who, in their eyes, is once again deserving of the title of son. But Matthew's relationship with his parents isn't the only one that stands out in this episode. See, episode two also focuses quite intently on the relationship between two of Jesus' disciples, Thomas and Rhema. Throughout the episode, we learn more about Thomas' desire to propose to Rhema. But in these conversations, we also sense an awkwardness, like there are customs that need to be fulfilled before this can happen. And the truth is, there were. You see, in Jewish culture, betrothal was much more serious and specified than your typical engagement process today. If Thomas and Rhema decided that they were interested in marriage, he wouldn't get down on one knee and propose. The first step in a betrothal process would be for their families to get involved. Thomas's father and Rhema's father would meet, and not only would they discuss whether the marriage of these two young people was even a good idea, they'd also discuss if the joining of these two families was wise. And that's because in Jewish society, it was a collectivist society, right? What mattered most was the community, the needs of the people collectively. It wasn't just two individuals getting married, it was two families. They would be connected for life and they would be intimately involved in one another's lives. So if their two fathers decided that it was a good fit for these two individuals and these two families to unite, 
then the formal engagement process could begin. But there's a problem, right? Thomas's father isn't alive to speak to Rama's father. So Thomas does something really important, something easy to miss. He asks Jesus. And this is one of those moments that highlights the relationship between a rabbi and a disciple. The relationship between a rabbi and a disciple was in many ways like the relationship between a father and a son. In fact, in some Jewish literature, it says that if a disciple had to choose between his rabbi and his father, he is to choose his rabbi. So it's really significant that Thomas goes to Jesus in this moment. The only problem, though, is that because of Jesus' tenuous relationship with Rama's father, he can't step in and perform these paternal matchmaking responsibilities. Thomas and Rama will have to go about it in another way. And it won't be easy. Because not only does Rama's father have concerns about Jesus, he has good reason to be concerned about the life that Rama and Thomas will be living the dangers that will follow them as Jesus' disciples. And some of those dangers will most certainly come from the men we're going to talk about in our next insight, the Roman military leadership. Throughout The Chosen, we've been introduced to many different Roman military leaders. And if you don't have any familiarity with the Roman military machine, all of these titles can become quite confusing. For instance, in the show, Gaius officially holds the title of Primi Ordinae. But then again, isn't he also called a centurion? Are those the same things? Are they different? Well, within the Roman military, the standard fighting unit was something called a cohort. And a cohort was comprised of six centuries. And each of these centuries was led by a centurion. Now, these centurions differed in ranks. The most senior of them was called the Pilus Prior. And after that, there's a lot of disagreement about the next five ranks. But here's where Gaius comes into things. Just as there was an order to centurions where some were ranked higher than others, there was also an order to the cohorts. Right, the first cohort was superior to all the other cohorts. And because of this, all of the centurions in this first cohort were superior to the centurions of all the other cohorts. And collectively, they were given the name primi ordines. And that word primi means first. So within the cohort, they were the highest ranking centurions. So among centurions, Gaius was actually very high ranking. He had risen up to become the most elite in his cohort. But as we can tell in this show, he isn't the most important military official by any stretch. There are others who clearly outrank him, such as Quintus. Quintus holds the title of Praetor, or as they say it in the show, Praetor, right? But I'm giving you the Latin pronunciations. Early on, the position of Praetor had significant power and importance. He commanded an army and, and served as an elected magistrate. However, by the first century, at the time of Jesus, Emperor Augustus had changed the role of the Praetor somewhat. Instead of having magisterial responsibilities, the emperor reduced him to simply being an administrator. I mean, you can almost sense this in the show. While Quintus does command an army, and while he does seem to wield some power, he also seems strapped at moments, stuck in a position that has power, but not real power. He's stuck in the Roman bureaucracy. One man who seems to be free of this, though, is Atticus. Atticus's official title is Cohortes Urbani. Now, Cohortes Urbani is actually a more general term referring to troops who were almost exclusively stationed in Rome. They maintained a military presence in Rome even when other soldiers were stationed throughout the empire. They were recruited from within Italy. Outsiders really weren't allowed to be part of this group. And their role was that of maintaining public order. They controlled riots and counteracted mobs and gangs. So when we look at Atticus, we can see that he's really out of place, right? He's not in Rome. And yet at the same time, he seems to be exactly where the Romans would want him to be. Controlling mobs and riots that are forming in Israel keeping the peace in ways that he can't trust the typical Roman soldiers to do. Now, here's why this is important. Here, here's why you need to know this information. The Roman Empire was a vast and complex empire. And in order to manage this, power had to be divided and distributed. But in the midst of this, there was also a very intricate class system. And everyone was vying to rise up through that system. There was constant and cutthroat competition. Because the people around you, whether they were your superiors, your equals, or the people who served under you, 
all of them had the ability to thwart your rise to the top, either through their conniving or their incompetence. And one thing could ruin your future prospects. All it took was one mistake, one problem on your watch, and you were done. This is why Quintus is so moody. He's not just a soldier like Gaius and Atticus. He's a politician. He's constantly being judged, and what happens in Capernaum reflects on him. If he can maintain order, then his prospects are good. But if the zealots or these Jesus followers or anyone else proves to be a problem, disrupts the social order, that's on him. He doesn't care about these people. He doesn't care about their well-being. He cares about his future. And what he's trying to figure out right now is, is Jesus a threat to that? Now, Atticus, on the other hand, is more concerned about a different group, a quieter group, a group called the Zealots. In season two, we were introduced to a new disciple named Simon, whom Jesus and the others call Z. But the reason that Simon is called Z is because when we meet him, he's part of a group called the Zealots. But what exactly does that word zealot mean? And why is this the word that scripture attaches to his name whenever it lists him among Jesus' disciples? Well, for starters, zealots were a religious and political movement that began around 6 AD with a man named Judas of Galilee. They were known for violence. Like many, they believed that the Messiah would be a military leader who would come to overthrow Rome. You may often hear zealots referred to as the fourth philosophy. This is a term that comes from the first century historian Josephus. As Josephus is describing the primary groups of his time period in Israel, he mentions Pharisees, Sadducees, Essenes, and Zealots. Each had a different philosophy concerning who the Messiah should be, how he would come, and how they should live in preparation for this. Zealots trace their name from the Hebrew word kinah, which means zeal and jealousy. We see it in verses like Exodus 25, where God says, You shall not bow down to other gods or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. And in Numbers 25, where Phinehas slew an Israelite man who brought a Midianite woman into the congregation of Yah because he was as zealous among them as God was. And it's the second verse that really gives us a sense of the zealot movement and their approach. They wanted to purify Israel by removing everyone and everything, sometimes including their fellow Israelites, that they believed was causing the people to turn away from God. Because of this, there were actually mixed feelings about zealots. Some saw them as freedom fighters, others saw them as violent murderers. And Atticus sees them as a problem. But one thing that we don't see in The Chosen is how established this group really was. Zealots weren't just an underground movement of assassins. Zealots formed entire communities. They included women and children, families. Gamla, for instance, was a zealot community not far from Capernaum, up in the Golan Heights. Entire families lived in homes stacked upon one another on the side of a mountain. There was even a synagogue up there that Jesus very likely visited. Until one day, Rome came in and destroyed the entire community. They heard about the zealot uprising, and so they came in, and men, women, and children, all of them, were slaughtered. The same thing happened on Masada. This was a former palace of Herod the Great that was turned into a zealot stronghold until Rome came. And the zealots shored up their defenses until the night before Rome was about to breach their walls, when almost a thousand zealots inside Masada committed suicide. You see, this is the kind of threat that zealots were to Rome. This is how dangerous they were considered to be. And this is their demise. Right? They chose to free Israel through violence, and it led to nothing but violence and pain and death. But Jesus preaches a different message. He promises people a different path to freedom. He puts them on a different mission. And that's what we see in our final insight. Because you see, one of my favorite scenes in episode 2 of season 3 is the moment when Jesus tells the 12 disciples that he's going to send them out to heal and to preach the kingdom. In Mark's gospel, it says, And Jesus called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not put on two tunics. 
And he said to them, Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if any place will not receive you, and they will not listen to you, then when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. Now the chosen give significant attention to these instructions by Jesus. And they also highlight another point. Jesus states that these instructions are intended to contrast the practices of another popular group at that time, the cynics. Cynicism was a philosophy that arose in ancient Greece and focused on living a life of virtue that rejected conventional pursuits like wealth and fame and power. As a result, cynic philosophers would travel around with beggars' bags. There are some accounts of how they carried an extra tunic both as a change of clothes and as a pillow for where they slept. Now, at the time of Jesus, cynic philosophy was experiencing a resurgence. And Jesus' disciples are about to go out and do something that looks very similar to these philosophers. But in these instructions, Jesus is making sure that there is no confusion about who his disciples are or why they're traveling as they do. He's sending them out with his authority to heal in his name, to build his kingdom. There is to be no mistake about this. They aren't out for profit and they aren't taking precautions. They are doing something that seems impossible in circumstances that seem unsustainable. And that's because this is a mission of faith. The way that they live will testify to the God that they preach. Their behavior, the healings that they perform, will proclaim the kingdom just as strongly as their words. And here's the thing, there is no suggestion that this is going to be easy. In fact, one of the things that I love most about this scene is that Jesus makes it very clear that this will be hard. Being his disciple will be hard, it will be costly, and ultimately, for most of them, it will cost them their lives. But as I sat there watching this scene, as I, as I saw what Jesus was calling them to do, I don't know, I, I couldn't help but wish that I was in their shoes. Because, I mean, it, it, it's so clear that what they're doing is so worth it, right? They're building God's kingdom. They're changing the lives of the broken and the oppressed. They're, they're giving hope to the hopeless. They are disciples of the Messiah. And that is worth everything that we have. I mean, let me ask you, do you feel this as you watch this scene? Do you wish that you could join these disciples, make this journey? Do you wish that you could be a part of this thing that Jesus is inviting them to do? Because here's the crazy thing. You can. As Christians, being a disciple too often gets reduced to reading your Bible and attending church on Sundays. Discipleship gets minimized to being on your best behavior, being nice to people, not getting in trouble. But is that at all what we saw in this scene? I mean, is that really the picture that we get in Scripture? Discipleship is sacrifice. It's full surrender. It's a willingness to sacrifice the trappings of this earthly kingdom to experience the promises of God's heavenly kingdom. It's a willingness to face the things that can hurt our bodies because we know that they can't harm our souls. And it's a desire for our Savior that is so strong that we want nothing more than to be his reflection, to have others see him in us, because we know that there is absolutely no greater purpose for our lives. And I really want to encourage you to pray about that. Is that how you see your relationship with Jesus? Will you live the life of a disciple, the same life that Jesus calls his disciples to in this episode? And if that's not where you are, what does your next step need to be? Because if you're anything like me, this episode leaves you with a hunger, a desire to follow Jesus in the same way that they did, no matter where that might take you and no matter what that might cost. Well, that's it for this episode of The Chosen Explained. Now, before you go, make sure to click the link above and down in the description to download my free resource, Seven Biblical Secrets Hidden in the Chosen. And if you enjoyed this video and want to see more videos like this that will help you to see the chosen and the Bible in an entirely new way, then just click this link right here. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great week and we'll see you next time.